Good afternoon. Welcome to the Analyst. Today we'll be taking up five newspaper articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express and discussing them. The handout for the same will be available in the description of this video for your kind perusal. Please have a look at that. The first article that we'll be taking up is related to ports and shipping sector. As Prime Minister Modi said that the central government has ensured the ease of doing business in the ports, shipping and the inland water transport sector. The second article is related to population control and the trends in population growth. As population has declined in China by 2 million people in 2023 and the birth rates there have been declining since 7 straight years. And now the death rates have also jumped after the lifting of the COVID-19 restrictions. The third article is related to Foreign Contributions Regulations Act. As the FCRA license of Center for Policy Research was cancelled by the government. The fourth article is related to hate speech. As the Supreme Court said that the authority should ensure that there is no incitement to hate speech and violence. It directed the district magistrates and SPs to ensure the same. The last article is related to buffer stocks as the wheat in the government godowns has come down to a low. Now the first article is related to the ports and the shipping sector as Prime Minister Modi observed that ease of doing business has been improved in this sector. So we will be looking holistically at the ports and the shipping sector, the key government initiatives also. This is important in the paper GS3 in the topic infrastructure ports. Now first let's look at some basics about the ports in the shipping sector. India has a long coastline of about 7500 kilometers. Therefore, the majority of India's external trade, India's foreign trade is carried out through the ports. But if you look at the logistics sector as a whole, ports constitute about 5% only, whereas roads contribute about 57% in the logistics, which is costly also. And if you look at the logistics cost as a percentage of GDP, it is very high in India. In India, the logistics cost as a percentage of GDP is about 14%. Whereas in the BRICS countries, it is about 10 to 11 percent and in the developed countries, it is about 8 to 9 percent further low. And because India's external trade is carried out majorly through the ports, it is a huge disadvantage that 90 percent of India's external trade by volume is carried out through the ports and 70 percent by value is carried out through the ports. Although India is strategically located, that is, we have the Indian Ocean and the Indian Ocean has about one fifth of the world seas area and it accounts about 80% of the global maritime oil trade. Therefore, we have to improve in this sector. In India, there are 13 major ports and 212 non-major ports. Out of 13 major ports, 12 are government owned and one is private. And these major ports are those ports which are governed through the port trust authorities. Whereas the known major ports, they are governed by collaboration with the private PPP models that is involving the private sector also. And we have two models for the management of the ports that is service port model and the landlord port model. In the service port model, usually the services which are given at the port, they are given by the port authorities only that is the port authority acts not only as a landlord but also takes care of the operations which are given at the port that is the cargo handling especially and even the labor supply etc they are all controlled and the regulatory functions are also performed by the port authorities in the case of the service port model but of late the government has been implementing the landlord port model in a landlord port model the major port trust authority usually acts only as a landlord that is it performs only the regulatory functions and the port operations they are usually outsourced that is the private companies the private players they are usually providing the services at the ports and the capacity utilization if you observe at the Indian ports it is about 55 percent and going further it will be improving the capacity utilization means the total capacity that it can handle in terms of the million tons of cargo and the total capacity which is actually utilized now let's look at the world bank's logistics performance index also as per the logistics performance index report 2023 
India's position has improved. Overall, India is ranked at 38th position as per the Logistics Performance Index. But in the international shipments category, the India is placed at 22nd place, whereas it was at the 44th place in 2014. Now, why this performance has improved? There are a few indicators. For example, the dwell time. That is, the dwell time in the case of Indian ports has decreased. The dwell time means the actual time that a cargo vessel spends at the port in the actual loading unloading of the cargo. In the case of India, the dwell time at the ports has reduced to three days only, which is excellent because in the case of USA, it is about seven days. In the case of Germany, it is about 10 days. Likewise, the port operational efficiency has also improved because the average turnaround times the average turnaround times in the case of Indian ports, they have come down to less than one day, 0.9 days on an average. Whereas in the case of US, Germany, etc., they are about 1.5 days still. Therefore, India's rankings have improved. And the connectivity to hinterland has also been improved because of the PM Gati Shakti National Master Plan and such initiatives, which are promoting the connectivity of the ports to the hinterland ports and to other areas. And the investments in infrastructure have also improved. For example, through the involvement of private players through PPP and also through the adoption of newer technologies, etc., the infrastructure has been upgraded, which has further led to the improvement in the standing in logistics performance index. There is a Maritime India Vision 2030 also, which has contributed to it. It is a 10 year blueprint for overhauling of the maritime shipping sector in India and it is the latest venture of the Sagarmala program. Under this vision, the investment of about 3.4 lakh crore will be there to increase the cargo volumes. How it will help? This will lead to creation of jobs both direct and indirect and it will also generate more sources of revenue. Sources of revenue for the state-owned major ports too. Now, first let's look at the institutional framework regarding the management of the ports in India. Because there are two types of ports, the major ports and the non-major ports. The major ports, they are majorly controlled by the central government through the Ministry of Shipping. There is also a tariff authority for the major ports, although after the Major Port Authorities Act 2021, its role is not there now. Now, these are controlling the major port trusts. The major port trusts are actually controlling the major ports in India, whether they are private or public. And the environment related guidelines, they are given by the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Whereas in the case of non-major ports, they are controlled by the state governments. That is the state maritime boards are constituted, that is state government departments and the state maritime boards. They give directions to the non-major ports, whether they are state controlled or the private and the environment related guidelines, they come from the Ministry of Environment and Forest only. This is the broad institutional framework for the governance of the ports, the major and the non-major ports in India. Now there have been certain policy and legislative reforms which have been taken up by the government in the sector. One, the government came up with the Major Port Authorities Act 2021. This was a major governance reform because earlier what happened was that the tariff authorities for the major ports, they used to control the tariffs which were levied by the ports for the various services which were offered by the ports. After this act, the act ensured that there will be major port authorities boards which will be constituted. This is giving more autonomy to the major port authorities. That is, they will be empowered to fix their own tariff rates for the various services provided, for example, cargo handling, etc. at the ports. And there will be an adjudicatory board also which will be constituted. This will adjudicate the various disputes regarding the ports between the port management and the various customers and it will be replacing the temp that is the tariff authority for the major ports. So essentially this act ensures more autonomy in the governance of the major ports. And there is an act marine aids to the navigation act 2021. This ensures safety and efficiency in the vessel traffic services and it provides training and certification in this for the safety and efficiency in vessel traffic services. This 
certification will be at par with the international standards there is an indian vessels act 2021 also this act ensures that the vessels which are operating in the inland shipping in india they will have to be registered that is there will be certain norms and there won't be any loopholes to be exploited this will lead to standardization and there is a draft indian ports bill 2022 also which we will be discussing in detail which contains certain provisions which can be contentious too and the government has allowed 100% fdi under the automatic route under certain sectors related to ports that is port handling maintenance etc and to promote decarbonization in the maritime sector in line with the panchamrit commitments of the government the government has taken up various initiatives to reduce the emissions which are coming from the shipping sector that is for example the adoption of renewable energy the adoption of renewable energy has been increased for the case of major ports there has been a 14 fold increase in the adoption of renewable energy for example in the form of floating solar plants in the form of wind plants etc and the government has released the harit sagar green port guidelines and the discharges and effluents which are released usually in the harbor water they are also regulated by the government there is even a construction of the multimodal terminal which is being done by the government for example in jogigopa assam now let's look at the draft indian ports bill 2022 also which is the latest update in this sector this bill tries to ensure the environmental compliance that is india will be seeking to ensure that it meets the commitments which are given through the international treaties to ensure the containment of the pollution to minimize the pollution from the maritime sector for example the international convention for the pollution from the ships that is the marpol convention because india is also signatory to it and it encourages institutional changes for example it tries to establish and empower the state maritime boards which will be ultimately ensuring efficient functioning of the non major ports in india it provides for the dispute resolution mechanism and establishment of a national council also that is through this national council the growth in this sector will be fostered and there will be a structured development of the port sector in india it also strives to establish a maritime state development fund so essentially it is giving some positives that is it will ensure an optimum utilization of the long coastline of india and promote the development of shipping sector as a whole it will also address the logistics bottlenecks and it will ensure that india emerges as a major trading hub in the ports and shipping sector in india but there are certain concerns for example the maritime state development council this is a council which was established in 1997 through an executive order and it ensures some regulatory functions but this bill tries to give it a statutory status that this maritime state development council will become a statutory council having wide powers in this council usually the union minister of shipping acts as the chairman and the ministers of the various states or union territories which are bordering the maritime areas which are in the coastal region they are the members of this board this council and it will have unbridled powers also for example the new bill says that the government can ensure the operations of the port can be cancelled if it is not in line with the national policy and it leads ultimately to a centralizing tendency which should not be the way forward for example in the last 3 decades the cargo handling from the non major ports in india has increased from 8% to 45% in india also a world bank report of 2011 observes that the business handling the customer friendliness the ease of doing business of the non major ports is better in india and they are usually more customer friendly therefore rather than this centralizing tendency the more autonomy should be granted even to the non major ports also now the second article is related to population control and the trends the context behind it is that china's population has fell by 2 million people in 2023 and it's the second straight year when the population has declined and the birth rates have been declining since seven consecutive years and even the death rates have jumped after the lifting of the covid-19 restrictions this is important in gs1 under the topic population and associated issues 
So we will be looking at the context of population in India, the key measures which are taken up by India to control population growth and some recommendations too. Let's look at the World Population Report 2023 first, which gives some data. As per the report, India is on track to become the world's most populous country by 2023. The report actually suggests that by the middle of 2023 itself, India is going to surpass the population of China. And it is expected to grow for next three decades. But there is a positive sign that the working age population of India will be high. That is 68% people in India will be between the age group of 15 to 64 years. The age group which is considered to be the working age population. And the 25% people in India will be from 0 to 14 years of age. That is the young people will be also more. Therefore India is in a unique position whereby the young and the working age population is more than the children and elderly that is the population which requires care therefore india is rather well placed but there are certain population anxieties too for example there are disparate rates of growth in population growth in india that is in southern india the states have rather achieved the population control for example they have achieved the replacement levels already whereas in the northern India it will continue to increase for further two or three decades and there are further concerns that it might lead to size growth and distribution of human populations which may be different from what is normal and the policies are usually aimed at lowering of fertility rates and these policies may further skew the gender sex ratios etc and it will further lead to some concerns. If we compare the Indian population with China, the working age population of India and China as of now is similar that is 68-69% but the elderly population in China is double that of India whereas in the case of younger age population in India it is more. Therefore India will be experiencing demographic dividend for the upcoming couple of decades also. Now what is the need for population control measures? Why do we need to check the rate of population growth? First, it will lead to resource constraint because India accounts for 17% of the global population, but we have only 2.5% of the world's land mass area. We have only 4% of the world's freshwater resources. Therefore, we need to control the rate of population growth. Plus, it leads to an environmental impact also. That is, more population will require more resources, it will lead to a resource crunch and further lead to environmental degradation, pollution, destruction, etc. But there are certain challenges with the population control policies. For example, it will have an anti-poor bias. Because the poor people, they usually tend to have more children. And if we implement any population control policies, there are fears that they will be disproportionately impacting the poor people. Likewise, there will be democratic concerns. That is, it will be affecting the citizens' rights, violating the citizens' rights. Reproductive autonomy will not be there with the citizens if the government imposes bans. For example, what China did, that is, it implemented the one-child policy for a long time. And it will be impacting the socio-economic factors too. That is, usually the thinking is that more people, more children will lead to more working hands. And as long as there will be poverty, as long as there will be poor access to health education, there will still remain higher birth rates and the total fertility rates will be higher. And there are certain challenges when if we try to implement the two-child policy also because a year back a private bill was also tried to be introduced in the parliament for implementing a two-child policy in India. What are the challenges regarding a two-child policy? One, it will lead to a risk of gender imbalance. Because usually if the first two children are girls, it might lead to female infanticide or female feticide. And 2011 census data even points to it that in Uttar Pradesh, there is already gender imbalance which is exhibited. That is there are 908 females per 1000 males, which is not normal. Therefore, the government has taken up some steps till now also. One, the government has the mission Parivar Vikas. Under this mission, contraceptives and family planning services in high fertility districts are given. That is, contraceptives are promoted and the adoption of family planning services, particularly in those districts where the total fertility rate is more than 3. It is implemented. The new contraceptive choices are also offered, for example, inter 
injectable contraceptives and the intrauterine devices which are inserted immediately now the postpartum insertion is also promoted that is the insertion of intrauterine devices after delivery itself and there are awareness building measures which are taken up by the government for example a 360 degree media campaign like the promotion of innovative promotional activities like saas bahu sammelans nayi pehal kits distribution such measures they are ultimately promoting awareness there is a compensation scheme for sterilization acceptors that is the people who voluntarily willingly come forward to get themselves sterilized they are compensated for the loss of wages if they are not able to work for that day and for a few days after that there is a scheme for home delivery of contraceptives by the asha workers too that is the people who are feeling shy or who are not willing to go and get the contraceptives themselves asha workers go for the home delivery of these there is a family planning logistics management and information system this is a software which predicts the demand supply of the family planning related equipments and services in the health centers and accordingly they are arranged there is national family planning indemnity scheme too according to which they are insured that is in case of extraordinary cases of death accidents etc in the case of sterilization or such services family planning services the victims will also be insured through this scheme indemnity scheme what are some suggestions regarding this to ensure the population control one we can promote the strengthening of infrastructure infrastructure in the medical sector medical infrastructure and not only that promoting the improvement in the socio economic indicators that is health and education indicators because as education levels improve birth rates naturally start coming down as is the case in the developed countries also likewise we can learn from the southern states what did they do like tamil nadu karnataka kerala etc they empowered women they encouraged the participation of women in the workforce they improved the indicators related to education health etc and that naturally led to the control of population growth and we can promote the adherence to the cairo consensus it promotes reproductive rights it empowers women it promotes universal education it promotes maternal and infant health because as the fears of infant mortality come down naturally the birth rate will also start coming down because people will not be afraid of having one or two children only they will not be afraid that their infant might die and increase in modern contraceptive prevalence this is the cairo consensus we can promote a women centric approach while adopting population control measures for example incentivizing later marriages later childbirth like the step of increasing the marriageable age of women to 21 years it might be a positive step because it will lead to fewer child births going forward in future controlling population we can be promoting participation of women in the labor force that will achieve the twin objectives of ensuring more economic growth ensuring that india achieves its potential gdp and also controlling population growth and population should be seen as a resource rather than seeing population as a burden it is a human resource which contributes through the development growth in the society in the economy and we can address the issues related to the aging population for example if we provide for insurance or savings etc if there is no fear among the aging population future dependency ratios will be improved and ultimately it will lead to lesser population growth now the next article is related to fcra foreign contribution regulations act the context behind it is that the fcra license of center for policy research was cancelled this is important in the paper gs2 in the topic ngos shgs etc the role of the development industry now first let's look at the timeline of fcra the foreign contribution regulations act initially the foreign contributions the donations which the ngos received they were not regulated but during the times of emergency after 1976 it first came into picture when fcra was originally introduced to keep track of the foreign donations how the foreign donations are influencing the social political economic and religious decisions in india At that time the non profit organizations they were allowed to freely receive the foreign donations but they had to report the amounts they received and the amounts they spent every year this was changed in 1984 
when it was made mandatory by the government to register themselves that the non profit organizations they have to register themselves before receiving any foreign donations and they cannot pass on the funds they receive to any other non registered ngos now these provisions were amended twice first in 2010 the earlier 1976 was act was repealed and it was replaced by the fcra act 2010 and it was amended in 2020 again we will be looking at the provisions of both 2010 act and 2020 act and the recent supreme court observations when it upheld the amendments in the fcra 2020 what did 2020 10 act say some key changes were introduced in fcra that is the registration of the ngos that will not be valid forever it will be valid for only 5 years after that it will have to be renewed that is the registration will be subject to renewal every 5 years and the total foreign contributions that the ngos were receiving out of that only 50% can be spent as an administrative expense that is as an expense on running the organization on running its administration remaining 50% has to be spent for the purposes for which the organization works for which the fund was received in 2020 there were some more changes which were introduced first let us look at the salient features of the foreign contribution regulations act 2010 as per this act every person or ngo which seeks to receive foreign donations they will have to be registered under the act if they are not registered they are not eligible for receiving any foreign donations and it will be illegal after registration they have to open a bank account that bank account has to be mandatorily opened in the state bank of india sbi in new delhi only and the utilization of the funds that they receive that has to be done only for the purpose for which the fund was received otherwise it will amount to violation of the act and they have to file the annual returns that is they cannot transfer the funds to another ngo and they have to file returns also there is a prohibition of receipt of foreign funds also that is certain entity certain people cannot receive foreign funds any donations cannot be received for example the journalists for example the candidates who are contesting elections judges government servants etc they are not eligible to receive foreign funds as per the fcra 2010 and the government can cancel the registration also on a few grounds that is if there is any violation of the act that is the government discovers any activity or any act or omission done by the ngo which amounts to violation of the act the government can cancel the registration registration can be revoked on a few grounds for example if there is no reasonable activity on part of the ngo that is the field in which ngo is working if there is no reasonable activity for the sake of public welfare for two continuous years by that ngo then its license may be revoked that is its registration may be cancelled that is essentially when it becomes defunct it can also be revoked in public interest that is in the opinion of the central government if public interest requires the revocation of the registration it can be done if in the audit there are any irregularities in the finances of the ngos which are found by the government again the registration can be in- revoked for example the misutilization of funds that is also an irregularity and once the registration is cancelled the ngo will not be eligible for re-registration for 3 years after that the government can also suspend the registration for 180 days pending the investigation and it can even freeze the accounts of that ngo also now these measures went through some more amendments in 2020 what did the new 2020 amendment say one the public sector employees are also forbidden from receiving any foreign contributions no foreign donations can be received by the public sector employees also the transfer of funds received under fcra to other individuals or other organizations is also prohibited now the quantum of administrative expense that is the total amount of funds that the ngo is receiving for as foreign donations out of that earlier 50% could be used as administrative expense now that has been reduced to 20% only that is only maximum of 20% of the foreign donation can be used as an administrative expense by the ngo the provision that 
आधार नंबर विल हैव टू बी मैंडेटरीली फर्निश्ड बाय द की पर्सनल की ऑर्गेनाइजेशन पर्सनल ऑफ द एन जी ओ दैट इज प्रोवाइडेड अंडर सेक्शन ट्वेल्व ए ऑफ द एक्ट ऑल दो द सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज स्ट्रक इट डाउन अंडर दिस दैट ऑल ऑफिस बेरियर्स डायरेक्टर्स एंड की फंक्शनरीज ऑफ द ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हैव टू मैंडेटरीली प्रोवाइड देयर आधार नंबर सो दैट देयर एक्टिविटीज देयर डिटेल्स कैन बी ट्रेस्ड देर आर पावर्स टू द गवर्नमेंट दैट it can suspend the fcra registration for more than 180 days also under fcra 2010 the government could suspend the fcra registration for up to 180 days when an investigation is pending or it can freeze the accounts now it can be done after 180 days also and the renewal of registration after 5 years it will be done as if it is a new registration that is it will have to go through all the checks similar rigors will be there when it will be tested whether it needs or whether it is eligible for registration and the designated fcra account will have to be mandatorily created with sbi new delhi only also there is an option that the fcra certificates can be voluntarily surrendered by the no profit organizations now now the supreme court has upheld the 2020 amendments while upholding these the supreme court observed that these amendments are necessary to strengthen the compliance mechanism because there is often a misutilization of the resources that is the funds which were received from the foreign sources they are not utilized for the purposes for which they were received and they are also transferred to various organizations that is a series a layered series of money trail is created which hides the real utilization of funds and it is important for ensuring sovereignty and integrity of the nation is upheld and public order is not violated plus the court observed that there has been an increase in the inflow of foreign contributions that is the court observed from 2010 to 2019 the foreign contributions have almost doubled and various organizations have failed to comply with the statutory formalities the basic statutory formalities while the court read down the section 12a of the amended act this section provided that the aadhar numbers of all the key office bearers of the organization or ngo have to be furnished the supreme court read it down the supreme court observed that providing the indian passport should be good enough for this and the court also said that it can the state can even completely prohibit the acceptance of foreign donations that is the state can completely prevent any foreign donations also if it is affecting the constitutional morality of the nation now the next article is related to hate speech the context behind it is that the supreme court said that authorities have to be vigilant and ensure that there is no incitement to violence and hate speech they are not permissible it was directing the district magistrate and sps to ensure that there are no instances of hate speech and violence during rallies conducted by various politicians this is important in gs2 in the topic governance it can be used in gs4 ethics also now hate speech has not been defined per se in any law but before that what is the meaning of hate speech the hate speech can be any expression by words oral written or any expression which advocates or incites or attempts to incite hatred violence or even discrimination against certain people now this hate speech can further lead to hate crimes also there are certain dangers due to this hate speech one it can affect the peace and tranquility in the state when peace and tranquility is affected it will lead to law and order problems it can lead to discrimination creation of panic in the society it can even lead to ethnic violence that is some minorities may be targeted using hate speech and the religious feelings of some minorities may be outraged it can lead to oppression it can lead to economic concerns also for example when there is a climate of fear distrust mistrust in the society it will affect the ease of doing business ultimately it will be affecting the livelihoods and thus the cohesion the social capital in a democratic society will be in grave danger and it is important to control hate speech for ensuring the protection of human rights for ensuring the rule of law to curb intolerance to curb hate crimes etc therefore it has to be curbed now article 19 in the indian constitution provides for the freedom of speech and expression 
but there are no fundamental rights also which are absolute there are always reasonable restrictions which are prescribed for example under the constitution article 19 sub clause 2 to 19 sub clause 6 they provide for reasonable restrictions article 19 sub clause 2 provides for restrictions upon the freedom of speech and expression now if you look at the legal provisions there are certain provisions under various statutes although there is no meaning which has been given to no definition which has been given to hate speech in statutes for example in ipc indian penal code section 153a provides that promoting enmity among different groups on the basis of various grounds like race religion place of birth language etc it will constitute an offense and it is punishable for up to 3 years of imprisonment likewise section 505 of ipc provides that any action or speech which promotes public mischief will also be an offense it, it will be punishable which creates public mischief under representation of people act 1951 again the freedom of speech has some restrictions for example under section 8 any candidate who is contesting elections he will be disqualified if he illegitimately uses his freedom of speech and expression if he is using it to polarize to hurt the feelings or he is using hate speech against certain groups likewise in protection of civil rights act 1955 there are certain provisions like section 7 says that promotion encouragement or incitement of untouchability will constitute an offense or speaking anything which is related to untouchability promotion of it indirectly also will constitute an offense likewise religious institutions prevention of misuse act 1988 provide certain provisions that is under section 3 sub clause g of the religious institutions act 1988 the religious institutions are forbidden from providing their premises for the promotion of actions which might incite violence which might incite or which might create provocation and leading to hate speech hate crimes etc now there are certain case laws also regarding this where the court has observed how to control the hate speech one in parvasi bhalai sangathan versus union of india the court observed that the existing statutory provisions if they are implemented properly they will themselves control to a great extent this meanness of hate speech but they have to be implemented there the court encouraged that the state should take up preemptory action and the law commission of india should further examine whether it should be included as a separate offense in ipc or not the court shied away from any judicial overreach in the case shain abdullah versus union of india the court observed that the authorities must register an fir even so moto fir can be registered that if there is a complaint received regarding hate speech the authorities have to register fir otherwise it may even amount to a contempt of the court likewise in tehsin pune wala versus union of india case the court observed recently that there should be some comprehensive guidelines the court framed some comprehensive guidelines regarding the prevention of hate crimes including mob violence and lynching etc the court recommended that the state should take preventive remedial and punitive measures there should be fast track trials there should be victim compensation the victim who has faced hate speech and there should be deterrent punishment that is the punishment should be such that it creates deterrence in the society and that no further person resorts to hate speech and there should be disciplinary action against law enforcing and officials who do not perform their duty and there should be appointment of nodal officers these nodal officers should take note of the hate crimes and they should register the fir thus there has to be a comprehensive approach on dealing with the hate speech now the next article is related to buffer stock the context behind it is that the wheat stocks in government godowns have depleted to a 7 year low although they are still above the minimum buffer limits but still they have declined this is important in the paper gs3 under the topic public distribution system functioning limitations revamping and the issue of buffer stocks the buffer stocks are the minimum levels of the agricultural commodities which the government maintains so that they can be used in extraordinary times for emergency use purposes whenever there is lesser production of crop natural calamities disasters etc 
for that the government maintains a minimum stock also it is used for the implementation of the public distribution function that is the distribution of food grains at cheap prices to the population now what are the objectives of the buffer stock one it ensures food security that is the agriculture production of various commodities it can vary year wise some day some years there can be less rainfall and it might lead to the lesser production and it will help in implementation of welfare schemes that is the distribution of food grains through pds targeted pds etc and for the emergency use purposes that is in case of crop failure in case of natural calamity flood drought etc the buffer stock can be liquidated and the requirements of the population can be met it will ensure the price stability let's understand this with the help of a graph for example this is the price this is quantity if this is the targeted price at which the government wishes to maintain the price of this of any agricultural commodity and this is the demand which is relatively inelastic and this is supply if the supply increases from s1 to s2 then the price will be decreasing to p2 from p1 therefore the government will have to absorb that excess supply of the agricultural commodity from the market to ensure that the targeted price remains at this level whereas if the supply decreases then the price will increase to p3 then the government will have to liquidate some amount from the buffer stock to ensure that the prices come back to the targeted price so this is how through the market intervention mechanisms the government ensures the price stability of any agricultural commodity in the long run it will ensure the better returns for the farmers also because the minimum prices are guaranteed through the msp mechanism by the government but there are certain issues with this one it has a procurement cost that is the cost involved in the warehousing in the wastage when there is no liquidation when every year there is excess production and less consumption it might lead to wastage also it leads to an environmental cost also for example the implementation of msp the minimum support price it has led to the skewing of the crop patterns that is more water intensive crops are grown particularly in the northern plains like in punjab paddy is grown whereas it should not be done as it will lead to further declining in the groundwater levels and it leads to trade distortion also and due to this trade distortion because of the implementation of msp and buffer stocks there are allegations which india faces at the wto agreement on agriculture that india is giving amber box subsidies in the name of msp which is actually not true and the open ended procurement it further leads to wastages and excess procurement by the government therefore we can follow the shanta kumar committee recommendations the shanta kumar committee recommended that there should be an transparent open liquidation policy a proactive liquidation policy thank you